Hello, everybody. Welcome to the panel uh, here in, in the room and online. Uh, thank you so much for joining us for this panel on success stories on economic narrative change. Uh, my name is Akira. I'm the CEO of Imperative 21. We are a global network of organizations that are building narrative power for a just and inclusive economy. Um, and, uh, you know, like many of you in this room, um, we've been putting uh, as a core priority narrative change, understanding that uh, stories are how we build our understanding of the world and certainly about the economy that we all participate in. We're talking about narrative change because to advance, sorry, to advance economic policies, we need to be in a new story. The current dominant neoliberalist story defines who and what we value. And that does not include all of us. And it certainly doesn't include caring about all the things that we care about. We are in a story that defines economic success through GDP and not through the lived experience of working people. This isn't fertile ground to build new ideas that care for all of us. So I'm excited to have this panel uh, of economic narrative experts to chat about narrative change. We have with us today Lindsay Owens, the executive director of Groundwork Collaborative. Alexis Krieg is a director on the strategic communications team at Midyear Network. Amanda Janu is the economic policy leads at WeAll. And Nedi Hedjde, sorry, is the managing director of the American Economic Liberties Project. Welcome, everybody. I thought we could start. Yes, thank you. Please welcome. I thought we could start with talking a little bit about what narrative change is. Uh, and I wrote just a short definition here to get us kickstarted, and then maybe I can shift it to you, Alexis, to get a more professional <laughs> take on it. So I wrote that narrative change is the shifting of mindsets, paradigms, and cultures to impact how we behave and understand the world. It's long-term, it's non-linear, experiential, and emotionally felt. It's a people-based storytelling. Absolutely. I think that is a great starting definition. And if, but if I could simplify it even one step further, I would say like when I talk to my parents about what it is I do all day, it's like I'm trying to redefine what common sense is about a particular thing. Um, so I I will um, lean into the storytelling aspect and maybe start off kind of about the difference between I get asked all the time, uh, what is strategic communications narrative change? Like, how are those the same? And as somebody that came up in, in my professional career as a full-time flack, I believe strongly in the importance of strategic communications as an aspect of narrative change, but they are different. Um, and I will explain that by talking about sharks. So apologies to anybody who's going to the beach um, for their summer vacation about leading into this. But I want you to think about, um, you know, maybe last year you heard a story or read uh, somewhere online about some shark attack that happened at the beach that you're going to, right? That is, think about that like um, an earned media hit, okay, strategic communications. Um, and then maybe when you were 10 years old, you, like me, saw Jaws and were scarred for life. That is the, an example of powerful storytelling, right? Another important tactic. Um, and maybe as you're heading to the beach, you see a sign that's like, you know, beware sharks, whatever. That's, press release, okay? Um, and all of those things have kind of added up over time, plus, you know, 50 others that I don't have time to mention. Um, and as you are getting into the water, even though you may know, like, the stats on shark attacks in the world, which is, like, for, for the record, it's, like, one in 3.7 million or something, right? It's so incredibly unlikely that you are going to be see, get anywhere near a shark. But you have that moment where you're like, oh, like this water's really deep and I can't see and like, oh, what was that thing? And I and that right there is the power of narrative. It is all of it is the accumulation of stories and all of this incoming at you over the course of your life um, that confirms a feeling, a gut feeling that you kind of already had about the world. Um, or maybe it didn't start out as a gut feeling, but because of all that incoming, it became true to you. So that to me is kind of like the perfect example of, of what narratives are um, and, and how, you know, the different pieces of strategic communications can lead up to them, but it, it is, um, they're of each other. I'm, I'm stealing this shark example from here. Yeah, <laughs> I will credit do. you, but I am stealing yeah, it. Please. Um, and that, that's, that's, that's really helpful because, yeah, I think one thing that I've always struggled to explain is how immersive narrative change work is yeah. and how it's so many different pieces over time. And I think that that, 
really, really encapsulates. Yeah, uh, literally the water we swim in. Mm -hmm. so. so, thank you. <laughs> so maybe I can move this to 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 all of you on the panel. What narratives do we need? To um, so that the policies reflect an economic vision, a progressive economic vision. What are the kind of narratives that we need to to start uh, building from? I can start. Um, so at We All, we're really trying to advance a new narrative of progress that moves us beyond a focus of economic growth um, towards a centering of people and planet's well-being. And I think in order for us to have any new narrative around the economy, we have to ask the question, what is the economy? Because we've been talking about it for the last two days, but we haven't really spent the time to even dive in and see if we have that shared understanding. And so we define the economy as the way we produce and provide for one another. It's a means, a method by which we improve our collective quality of life and believe that we're lost if we forget that everything we produce comes first and foremost from the earth and everything we provide is valuable insofar as it contributes to our collective well-being. And so the power of the neoliberal narrative is that it was able to elevate GDP, stock market values, maybe employment figures, any time we talk about the economy, we are evaluating its success in terms of those kind of metrics. And not only the economy's success, but our societal success. And that led us to legitimize, encouraging, and rewarding the large corporations and investors who are seen as the most efficient at supporting that growth. But once we begin to center social and ecological goals and indicators as our metric of success, then that opens up our imaginations to think about what kind of aspects of the economy do we want to grow and why, and to recognize that there are a lot of different aspects and ways in which we produce and provide for one another that isn't just business and finance, but also the government, as well as our households and our communities and the ways that we care for one another. So definitely new narratives that redefine success and redefine value uh, is, is, is what I'm hearing. Uh, any others from, from the panel? Um, I can go. So I work at the American Economic Liberties Project, which is an anti-monopoly research and advocacy organization. And I think that, you know, when we are taking on like monopolies and trying to tell the stories of the harms that they have and calling for action, one of the things that we have to do actually first before we even put forward like a progressive uh, vision is first like, you know, really confront the existing narrative that has is that is deeply, deeply entrenched about how our markets work. And, you know, there are these like deeply entrenched beliefs that free markets, you know, yeah. provide a level playing field for everyone, that they recognize like differences and they reward people for like superior like products and that markets are rational and natural. Like there's no human in the story, like no one's responsible for the market, but corporations get rewarded, right? And I think that, so when we confront that, what we're saying is that actually, Markets are public creations with democratically governed rules. Public officials are responsible for markets and they regulate markets, right? So when they abdicate that responsibility, those set of humans, that's when corporations are coming in, they're writing the rules. And so that allows us in, you know, when we construct this story, it allows us to say, hey, here's an actor when you understand the harms of monopoly, when you, when you, you, you know, and people understand that, people feel that, they have someone that they can turn to and say, actually, you have the authority to fix this. Like, I have given you the power to fix this. And I think that that, it's, so it's not really a new narrative. It is a narrative that, it, that has been constructed over 40 years as like policymakers have, you know, really embraced neoliberal like ideals of free markets. Like, there was a time before they did not do this. So I think that that's a little bit of like what we're doing, where it's not, I think it's just really first like confronting and dismantling mm -hmm. this narrative and like putting people back, not just like workers and you know small businesses and communities, but also the role of policymakers in our economy and their responsibility and holding them accountable for it. Yeah. Yeah, I would just add, I mean, I think Nitty is exactly right. Um, the reason that this work is so hard, the reason that narrative change work on the economy is so hard is because there actually is a really clear prevailing cultural common sense around the economy. Um, and, and it's a neoliberal one. It's an old one. Um, it's one that um, looks exactly like what Nitty just described. I mean, groundwork, you know, 
kind of proto groundwork um, when we were sort of doing research uh, building out our organization, you know, we did some focus groups and we did them with progressives. <laughs> um, and we asked progressives sort of what the conservative model of the economy is, what it looks like. And uh, they had a really clear sense of it, right? It's tax cuts, it's deregulation, it's moving government out of the way so that markets can do what they do best, um, deliver goods efficiently. It's moving the government out of the way, getting the government out of business his way so that markets can do what they do best, deliver goods efficiently. Um, it's cutting taxes so that corporations have a little more money to do what they do so well, <laughs> right? Um, the progressives were really, really clear on on that model, and you know when you do polling, you you find that a lot of this stuff um, still polls very well. People, um, you know, like the idea of getting government out of business's way. Um, then we asked the same, you know, the same group of progressives, you know, what a sort of progressive vision of the economy might be, and you know the answers are all over the place. I mean, you know, there's no coherence, uh, there are no common threads, there's no existing clear cultural common sense um, for a new affirmative vision of the economy. Instead, what you get is this um, really disparate list of policies, progressives like healthcare, progressives like small businesses, progressives like gender justice, prog progressives like healthcare. Um, and so, you know, the work, <laughs> the work that we're all doing is so, is so incredibly, um, important, but so incredibly complex because we're not offering a new story um, into a vacuum. We have to both supplant the old story uh, and knock the old story down, which I think a lot of us have done really great work um, along those lines. But um, you know, as my dad, my dad used to say, Lindsay, you can't beat something with nothing, <laughs> right? So you also have to be able to. Um, to prop up that that affirmative alternative and and just you know really briefly, you know groundwork sort of position on what that affirmative alternative is looks a lot like what Amanda described. So I won't um, I won't belabor the point, but you know the kind of the the quick quip version is is we are the economy. The economy is all of us, and I do think personifying the economy is so critical. Um, it isn't like the weather. It isn't something that happens to you. It isn't something that like really fancy guys in Silicon Valley understand and create, but you don't have a role in. It isn't something Wall Street um, is in charge of, but you don't have a role in. Uh, the economy is all of us. It's our labor, it's our consumer demand, it's what we share, uh, it's what we it's what we sell, uh, it's what we buy, it's what it's it's what we, you know, it's what we do every day. So I think, you know, personifying it is really critical because um, the other side has kept it out of the out of the terrain of, of human agency and that's been a really effective tool. Um, but um, you know, it, you know, just just to say again, I mean, this is really tough work because we're supplanting something that's been deeply, deeply entrenched for decades. I mean, you know, you can start it at the 1980s. You can actually pull it back a little further if you want historically. Um, but you know, you know, 40, 50 years here of um, of something that is the cultural common sense. Amanda, did you have something you wanted to? Yeah, I just wanted to follow up on what Lindsay was saying because I do. So our. First of all, let me say, we all is a global organization and alliance. So our work in the US, which is sort of coming in and starting to understand more about the state of the narrative. But I would say there is a paradigm shift which is occurring globally and particularly amongst high income countries. So there was a survey of G20 countries and 74% of people believe that the economy should be working in a way that supports the health and well-being of, of people in nature rather than profit and wealth. And that was even as high as 68% in the United States, right? So people already have this different paradigm. They have an understanding that the economy should be working towards a different goal and purpose. And one of the ways in which this is manifesting is that governments are starting to listen to this, to start to recognize this as well. So we have helped to develop the Wellbeing Economy Governments Partnership, which is currently New Zealand, Iceland, Finland, Scotland, Wales, and Canada. And they have all developed alternative indicators to GDP, which are evaluating their progress by social and ecological well-being. And that, I think, is a really important starting point for then allowing us to have a framework to even start to evaluate um, our economy by a different kind of North Star um, in terms of what we are ultimately trying to achieve as a society. Do we have um, thoughts on what would it take to have what, what you were mentioning, a coherent um, co story that, that personifies uh, the economy as all of us? 
um, what, what does it take to build that kind of story? Or what are the obstacles for why we haven't done it so far if we've identified it as something we need to do? I'll start. I, I actually want to sort of going back to that last question. I actually think the, the like big, the, the ultimate boss bad narrative that we're, we're trying to get up against here is to what Lindy, Lindsay was speaking about of like the economy is not the weather. Um, it is actually, it's a, it's a machine. It's something we build. Um, and I think that like, when you really get to the root of it, like that's a big problem and people feel like there's no really, uh, they don't feel agency in how these things are, are being made. Like Lindsay said, it's Wall Street, it's Silicon Valley. That's where those decisions are being made. And so I think really just like twisting that and getting it through people's heads that like, no, this is these are things that are changeable. Because that's the other thing that's hard about breaking out of old narratives, right, is it feels so fossilized. Like there's no possible way. Um, and it, it makes it really hard for people to kind of like see an alternative, um, an alternative option. So I think that's like one of the big big challenges to get there. But with that being said, I do think like, I don't know, I, I feel sometimes when I come to these conferences that we're like, oh guys, we're not doing it and we're not getting across. And I actually think that we are. Like the fact that we are in this room and having these conversations, like I see so many great like green shoots of these conversations happening and like not just in rooms like these, right? Even among like my friends who aren't political, my family back in Texas um, of these like little things starting to pop up. And so I think we're, we're in that phase of like, you know, a thousand flowers are starting to bloom. Um, and I think we'll get there over time, but like that story is still, is still being written and I think that's okay. That, that also leads to um, why making it real, making it something approachable is so important. And one thing I wanted to ask you, Lindsay, about taking key moments that are happening that, that people can see and using those to drive uh, narrative change. Yeah, sure. So I'll talk about an example that um, is relatively recent and near and dear to our hearts at Groundwork. Um, you know, in, in sort of mid-2021, inflation started ticking up, right? And you know, for, for many folks at this conference, um, you know, we had spent the better part of a decade arguing that, you know, the Obama administration's response to the to the Great Recession was was too small and, and the result was really tragic, right? It was this jobless, stagnant, you know, tepid, barely recovery recovery, right? And um and the impacts were extraordinarily unequal, right? Um you know, black and brown families never recovered the wealth loss during during the recession. Um, they experienced, you know, mass prolonged long-term unemployment, um, inequities increased, um, and folks really wanted um, that to look different the next time there was a recession. And, uh, you know, as you heard earlier this morning, it did, right? The, the Biden administration did things differently. Um, they they put a real stimulus out there and, and they spent through the crisis. And as a result, you know, you heard the OMB director say, uh, we recovered all the jobs and 3 million more. I mean, what a concept to not just get back to kind of, you know, flatlining, but also to, to build, to use a crisis uh, as a moment to build. Um, but uh, the fact that inflation came rather quickly on the heels of that recovery package being passed meant that there was, um, I think, a real threat in, in a narrow political way. And that was that, you know, the Biden administration's, you know, if, if you're a Republican, profligate spending uh, was responsible for that inflation. Um, by the way, during that same period of time, um, workers were actually starting to like get a little juice in the workplace, right? Uh, people were voting with their feet. They were, they were shifting jobs. And so of course, uh, you know, the standard conservative playbook around this. So oh, those wage increases that those greedy workers were asking for, that was actually also contributing to inflation. Uh, businesses were forced to raise prices because they had to cover the rising costs of labor, right? So there were these two really clear kind of conservative narratives that were bubbling up, um, you know, lightly bubbling up, but bubbling up nonetheless. And, you know, the groundwork team, like, you know, we've seen this movie before. This is what happened in the 80s. Workers were blamed for that period of high inflation. And, you know, it was a, a quote unquote, what economists call a wage price spiral. So that's all just to set the stage a little bit. Um, what groundwork did is said, hey, um, you know, there's a different story to tell about why prices are rising. Um, there's a story about the people who set the prices, <laughs> you know, prices also don't fall from the sky, it turns out. There are 
guys, mostly guys, in boardrooms, uh, CMOs, CFOs, CEOs, COOs, <laughs> making decisions about how to dial up prices. Um, and those decisions, um, you know, should be featured. The, the, the corporations who are, you know, setting prices should be, um, should be centered in the story. And so we did that in a couple of ways. The first is we listened to corporate earnings calls, which, um, you know, I don't necessarily recommend as like an afternoon activity. It's, it can be quite dry. And, and I will say we, we use the term listened, but sometimes we just read them because it's a little quicker. Um, but, but what you saw in the earnings calls is this really amazing storytelling and personification of inflation, right? You saw CEO after CEO telling their shareholders, I mean, these are calls that, for, you know, for those who don't know, these are calls that CEOs of publicly traded companies have with their shareholders and with analysts and, and sometimes members of the press and the public, you can tune in um, to, to share a little bit of information about the business outlook. How did this quarter go? What is the quarter ahead gonna look like? And what they were telling their investors and their shareholders is actually, um, this was an opportunity for them that, yeah, their, their prices were rising a little bit, but they were able to pass along their rising prices and then go for more, gild the lily, take a little extra, dip in for just another spoonful of sugar. And, um, and we thought, wow, this is a really powerful body of, of evidence. Like, you know, it's, you know, as nerds, we're like, wow, what an interesting treasure trove of evidence. But we also thought as storytellers, wow, this is, these are really compelling spokespeople for a different story of the economy. And so we bundled up all of these, all of these stories and, and pushed them out. We pushed them out to policymakers. We pushed them out to the press. We pushed them out to the public pushed them out on social media, pushed them out to partners, worked with some of the folks on this panel to do that. Um, and what we were able to do is let the CEOs really speak for themselves. And um, Americans listened. And I think, you know, the reason that American listen, li Americans listened is actually quite simple, which is that um, we told a story of inflation that was very resonant, right? It was uh, the way Americans experience inflation. Americans don't experience inflation by uh, tuning in to Squawk Box on CPI day. They experience inflation when they're in the grocery store and Cheerios is up a dollar and their first instinct is, hmm, like General Mills is screwing me, <laughs> right? Um, they're, not, they're not thinking Jerome Powell is in charge of the cereal prices. They're not even necessarily thinking that, you know, President Biden is in charge of the cereal prices. Um, and so this story really met people where they are, right? It told the story of rising prices, not rising inflation. And it told a story of actors who were behind, um, you know, who were behind it. And so we just sort of, you know, we let that story bubble up until, you know, it became a sort of prevailing media story. And then, you know, then I don't want to talk for too long. We can talk about some of the details of how this was executed later. But then we sort of dialed it up in ways that I think, um, you know, resulted in this really nice shift that we're seeing in public opinion, where not only do the majority of Americans think that corporations are um, responsible for rising prices, actually now if you look uh, at polling of Democrats, Democrats think uh, corporations overcharging and corporations juicing profits is a top economic concern even above rising prices. So it's a, a corporate power story that actually started as an inflation story, but it has transcended inflation and now is becoming a little bit of a cultural common sense around the economy as well. Yeah. One place I want to dig in a little bit deeper is on on the uh, what you mentioned about CEOs speaking for themselves, so finding creative, uh, interesting spokespeople. And, and uh, uh, Nnedi, I would like to have you um, maybe talk a little bit about finding new storytellers uh, that can drive uh, narrative change. Sure. Just if I can also just like respond to the key sure. moments on like sort of two key moments I think that everyone here has like so knows about and experiences. So last summer was one of the first summers when like everyone after two years of being cooped up and COVID decided they could finally go and see their families, go on vacations, you know, travel. So what people started to fly. And I think everyone remembers this complete like summer of chaos of like airline cancellations, of bags being left at, behind, like families with their kids in airports endlessly, like just not knowing what's happening. And that for us was a key moment to again tell the story of consolidated power. The consolidated power and like of airlines were not regulated 
and what that means for consumers, what that means for pilots, what that means for like, you know, flight attendants, for baggage handlers, because you saw all the harms like just really come together for the, this perfect storm for like three months. And so we were there every day, like sort of helping shape that narrative and like taking advantage of that. I mean, like this is a story of abuse of power, of monopoly power, like, and you know, like similar to what Lindsay said, we had the CEO of like Delta Airlines, like it was on CNN and he got asked by the journalist, like, so this summer was really hard for you. Did you learn anything from that? And he said, no, <laughs> that was it, you know? And so like the arrogance, right? Because they're that powerful. And we, and we knew also, again, this is gonna happen in Thanksgiving. This is gonna happen over Christmas. And so again, like, you know, sort of telling that story, like, you know, using those moments to like connect it up and we also clearly had a target. Secretary Buttigieg, the Department of Transportation, could do something about it. And so we set our sights on him. And this year, we saw them act. Like for the first time in years, the Department of Transportation decided that they would block a merger between two airlines. So they took on corporate consolidation. So I think that this was like where taking that key moment, the stories, the experiencing, experiences that people are having and like also the arrogance of these corporations and the CEOs to drive like policymakers like you didn't have any other choice you know but to do that yeah. so and there's of course like I think everyone knows about breaking up Ticketmaster and how the Swifties <laughs> came on so that's again another like you know moment where like you really can you know leverage like these like key moments where like the public it doesn't have to be very complicated yeah before, the ask is simple. Yeah, before I come back to you on, on storytellers, I want to just lift up a couple of things that, that we heard. Is One is identify a responsible actor. So it's not just this thing out there that's doing it. Uh, center a resonant experience in, in the storytelling um, that I felt that pain of. As soon as you said that summer, I was like, oh, I remember that. Uh, I was refeeling it kind of like the, <laughs> the shark story and demystifying the, the policy so that it's understandable through, through these through these methods. I think there's another thing in both of those stories, which mm -hmm. they illustrated beautifully, which is the importance of having a villain. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and sometimes it can be a very specific, the head of Delta or, you know, a particular member. Um, and, but sometimes it is like, you know, writ large, like these corporations. Um, and you know, every story has a, the best stories have a good guy and a bad guy. And it's important to remember that. And I think just like seizing on key moments, like, I mean, that's just, seems patently obvious, but I do think in the narrative change community, we often look at time horizons over decades or generations. And of course, like there's truth to that, but uh, you really have to be able to spring into action in a key moment. And I think, you know, this inflation corporate power stuff, like one of the interesting things is we had a sense that, that there would be a soft target for this story in part because it had been 50 years since we'd had inflation before. And so to my point before about how difficult it is to supplant existing narratives, half of the US population, actually a little more than half of the US population, wasn't alive the last time there was a period of high inflation. And more than half like falls into the category I call not alive or not sentient, right? Like <laughs> you were seven, you weren't developing like strong priors about, oh, inflation is too much money chasing too few goods. Speak for yourself. <laughs> um, and so I also think we had a little bit of a vacuum there or we had space where there weren't strong priors. So there was a lot of the population who I think was was actually, you know, didn't wake up in the morning and think, I think that the reason that general, you know, that cereals, cere cereal, Cheerios is a dollar more is because of Jerome Powell. Um, you know, they, they had a, a sense that it was because of General Mills. And so we had a key opening there. And I think that was so critical um, to act in the key opening. And I, and I just think that, you know, the airline example and the Swifty example are both just like such great examples of seizing on those key moments. Men, did you have something that? Yeah, I wanted to, in addition to, I think maybe the, the story of the villain for us, core point of our narrative strategy is to move beyond critique of the current economic system to really try to center a hopeful, positive alternative towards which to work. And so for us, the reason why this is so important is because we believe that we need as many hands on deck as possible. We're trying to build a movement. And so for people to be able to see themselves and the work they're doing and the things they care about as a part and interconnected to this larger economic transformation that we seek. And so 
when people care about climate change and biodiversity loss, it's an opportunity for us to recognize that there are amazing examples of circular economy and regenerative economy um, initiatives that are, that are not only protecting, but healing our natural environment. Or when people talk about caring about fairness and dignity, that we don't need to just wait for the government to redistribute this wealth, but we can also organize around cooperatives and employee-owned businesses um, and community wealth building and more embedded small companies that are going to ensure a more equitable distribution of wealth and power from the first go around. And I think across the board, one of the major issues with our corporate globalization is that people feel like they don't have a voice. They don't have any power over our collective destiny. And one of the major issues is particularly economics, it's like the economy is the most important thing, but it also happens to be the area that's too complicated for you to understand, right? And so we use a lot of jargon and it's very inaccessible, but there's, if I think all of us are trying to deal with symptoms of this system, and if we come together and see that we're, we're stronger together than you know, the sum of our parts, then that's gonna create the push that is needed to really transform this paradigm and system. I think this connects really well to um, giving people a voice to drive narrative to the question I had for you, Nnedi, around how can we identify other storytellers to do rather than us on stage and some of us out here to, to drive some of that storytelling work. Yeah, I think that, you know, in terms of like one concrete example, like at Economic Liberties, we have an initiative called Access to Markets, where we try to like educate and engage small business owners. You know, these are members of the business community. They're a part of markets, but often their stories are not like told. So when we are setting up these conflicts with like giant corporations and trying to drive for change, instead of us being the ones talking about their power and how they are harming them, we get these like small business owners, these entrepreneurs who you know, are really passionate about the product that they're building. They just want to level playing feet. They want to compete. We get them to tell the stories. So just like from a tactic perspective, like, you know, lifting up those voices, like sometimes we will like offer them to like journalists who want to talk to us and like, hey, don't talk to us. Like talk to this Amazon seller. Don't talk to us. Like talk to this community pharmacist that we know. And so having, I think their words are really like powerful and it's like less, you can't argue with that. It's not some think tank in Washington <laughs> that's putting out this narrative, right? It's actual like people who are experiencing the economy. I think the other thing is like, you know, we've talked a lot about like telling stories, like bringing these trusted, like, you know, messengers, storytellers and our role in it. Government also plays a role in that. And I think this particular like sort of FTC chair, Lena Khan, has really sort of been amazing in that when she, you know, took charge, she started public meetings, like open commission meetings where anyone could come and they had the mic for a minute to talk about, tell their story about you know, any like problem that they were having with the economy. And it was incredible. Like you had, you know, people coming and talking about like insulin prices, like, you know, patients, you had pharmacists talking about it, you had farmers there, you had people who were running like repair shops. And so, and they were able to describe what they were feeling, the helplessness that they were feeling, what they were trying to build, what they were trying to do in their own words, not in the words of like economists, not in the words of lobbyists, like not in the words of lawyers, like, you know, and you would think like, oh, FTC, antitrust, like competition policy, like only economists and lawyers, you know, should be talking. And, you know, this FTC, this DOJ, like the leadership has made a choice saying, this is not just a domain of, you know, economists and lawyers, like the economy is not just a domain of, you know, lawyers and economists. So we want to hear from everyone. They did the same thing with something as obscure as like merger review guidelines. They set up listening sessions where, you know, they had people on different sectors of the economy come talk and tell their story of how consolidated power, corporate power had was, re was harming them in their life. And what was, I think, incredible is that they also made this very deliberate choice, if you go watch these, is that they actually went directly to the people it was not like, hey, you know, independent trade associations, send your representatives. Like, no, I want the independent grocer to come tell the story. Like, it wasn't the labor union like leader. It was the actual like sort of worker. And so they really sort of like bridge, like, you know, just reduce the distance between them and policymakers, like, you know, and regulators, like that intermediary was gone. And it was really powerful because after that, when they opened it up, you had a bunch of lobbyists and others and economists coming and talking in like numbers, like not telling stories. And it was just so apparent that they didn't know what they were talking about. It was really, really powerful. And so I think that public officials can really help 
Like when they start saying that, like, hey, we want to hear from you and create that opportunity, 26,000 people have told their stories of non-competes. They're attempting to ban non-competes, right? There are people against that. Corporations are against that. Rohit Chopra is brilliant. He has taken what corporations, like, you know, do to us, like where you, you get charged a service fee when you go to buy a ticket, like you get charged a resort fee at a hotel, even though it's not really a resort and you're in Manhattan and all <laughs> And, you know, and he was like, all these like overdraft fees, like these are junk fees and we're going to go after junk fees. You have a president who's very plain spoken and it really appealed to him, talked about it in his like state of the union. And so really, how do you like fight back against that? Like, so you've taken something that corporations and like Wall Street and others have been, you know, have marketed to us as like, hey, like this is a value that we're providing to you and it, you, you owe us, you, you have to pay us. And say so like, no, actually, no one likes to be a sucker. You're being taken for a sucker. And you know what, we're gonna fix that. And that, I think it's like, it really taps into an emotion that you're feeling. And so they set up that frame. So again, like people are speaking up, literally bringing the receipts into the comment, like, you know, docket. And I think that that's a powerful way to also create policy, to create like, right, you know, rules. Yeah, and as, as we're hearing how the power of giving people the platform to tell their personal story and to, um, and, and to speak uh, through emotion and through you know, a value of, I, like, I don't want a fairness. I don't want to be a sucker. Uh, Alexis, you've talked a little bit to me before about how data doesn't persuade people. Maybe you could speak a little bit more to that, given, given what, you know, uh, Nidhi was talking about just now. Yeah, well, I will say, I think, and one of the biggest mistakes that we make sort of as a, as a movement, and I say this with great love for my friends in the policy world, but is we often show up to a knife fight with a policy paper. And that doesn't cut it. I mean, we'll go back to the sharks. Like I can read you all of the statistics and give you all the data and show you all the things about how statistically you were, nothing's gonna happen to you when you step into the ocean. But that doesn't change all of the stories that you've heard. Um, and if you look at, you know, there's a, tons of data from like cognitive behavioral science that, that those hearing from other humans about their experiences, like we are wired to give that a lot more weight. Um, and so, yeah, I think whenever you can bring in normal people uh, to talk about their experiences, it, it makes it more real. And we see that across, you know, every different aspect of, of organizing work. Um, you know, I think particularly about, uh, we also do a ton of, of work around, you know, the labor movement and worker power. And, you know, if anybody follows More Perfect Union, I think they've done a fantastic job of like going to these places where workers are organizing and putting a camera and spotlight them on them. And it's like, they don't need talking points. They are living this. Um, and you can feel the passion and that resonates with people in a way that like, you know, my most polished talking point is never, never going to hit. So super important. Are there any other examples that you can think of where you've seen a narrative shift occur with, with a night spent through key moments or um, different storytellers? Are there any other ideas that come to mind or any other organizations that you think are doing a good job uh, with narrative shift? Yeah, I mean, we talk about some of the, you know, historical examples of, of narrative shift, which have been less in the economic space and more, you know, the Love is Love campaign around marriage equality, um, you know, things like seatbelts uh, and getting folks to actually, you know, wear them in cars. Uh, those are things that kind of like took, you know, many decades, lots of different types of organizing, often centered on kind of sharing personal stories in, in order to get to ultimately, you know, po policy and, and cultural change. Um, I think sort of in the economic space, you know, I was talking about the, many of the great uh, green shoots that are coming up and, you know, there's a ton. Um, I love, you know, Lindsay's example, Nidhi's example, I think are fantastic. Um, there's also, you know, organizations um, have put together a ton of different like types of narratives. So you see, you know, Anat Shankar Asario and We Make the Future have really pushed kind of race class narrative. Um, you know, we've seen uh, uh, Topos is a fantastic group and um, has has brought together kind of like a narrative learning community that's talking about like a people first economy, which is really exciting. Um, you know, the winning jobs narrative, community change has done great work around like building economic narrative labs where they bring in like real people to talk to them and kind of come from the grassroots up about like what are the problems and what are the solutions. Um, so yeah, I think there's a lot of really exciting things that are happening in this space. And um, I guess my charge to everybody here too would be like, you know, this is like, we're sitting up here as if we're experts, but like we are, we can all be experts in narrative change. And there's a lot of great opportunities and places to lean in and would encourage people to. So. Yeah. And speaking on, on lean, I want to lean into your energy, Lindsay, of oftentimes we're in spaces like this and we talk about what we don't have or what we haven't accomplished, but 
to Alexis's point, there's tons of stuff going on. There's tons of examples to look for. Uh, I want to ask a little bit about what kind of community uh, do we need uh, or, or is out there for people to who want to start connecting with some of these organizations uh, and some of the work that you guys are all doing? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I mean, first of all, I, I think Alexis is right. I mean, there's just an amazing kind of like renaissance in this space right now. And like, um, you know, since she's sitting right in front of me, I'll just shout her out. We, <laughs> we hired Abigail Stahl, um, who does this full time. And that's like kind of weird for an organization that's sort of a think tank and sort of a comm shop and sort of an advocacy shop to have a full-time narrative change person. But, um, you know, the, the, the goal of hiring Abigail was to do two things. One, um, you know, to have someone smart like that, um, inside thinking about this every day, but also two to have someone who, who could go hang out with all of these people, uh, and, and meet new people, um, and, and start to create some, some sense of community. And frankly, because I do think, um, Alexis is right. There are so many green shoots here also like help us make sense of it all. Like what's working, what's not working. Um, and you know, and this isn't a direct answer to your question, but, but on the topic of what's working and what's not working, I do think this is like a, you know, I mean, I, I come from academia. I'm a, I'm a social scientist who, I spent too much time with Alexis and Elizabeth Warren's office and got interested in communications. Um, so I do actually quite like empirics. Like I actually like to know what works and what doesn't work. And I am really not interested in spending a lot of time on a losing strategy. Um, and I think, you know, one of the interesting things is um, this is an early stage like project. And so I think experimentation is actually really key. And frankly, failing fast is really key too. I mean, I will say like Groundwork had a ton of success with the inflation work. The first narrative campaign that we took on um, when I joined Groundwork was on the child tax credit. Um, it, you know, it failed and it failed fast. <laughs> um, and I think being willing to kind of close the book on stuff that isn't working, try to learn some lessons from from why it's not working, you know, not over indexing on, on specifics. Like there's lots of variables this you know it's you know we're not running randomized controlled trials here but i think um really being open to to building on what works doubling down on what works and to trying new things is going to be really critical um in this space because um because you know this is relatively new terrain um and i guess the last thing i'll say about community is i do think this this narrative change work you asked this question earlier and i don't know that we all necessarily directly answered it you know, what does it take to, to tell a new story? It takes so much, right? I mean, Amanda talked about new indices of the economy. I mean, I, Groundwork is a big believer in those new indices. I do think the, the metrics that are driving our economic conversations and, you know, in the chattering class, um, CPI day, jobs day, they're not telling us enough, right, about, about the things we care about, about well-being. Um, they're not telling us anything about job quality or job satisfaction. It's just like, we created some jobs, supposedly that means the economy is strong. We lost some jobs, the economy is not strong, but that doesn't tell us a lot about how people are experiencing work. It's like new indices are critical, new um, messengers are critical. I mean, if you look at the people who drive conversations on the economy, it's a bunch of guys out of the Clinton administration, you know, and, and some out of Obama. It's Larry Summers, it's Austin Goolsby, it's Jason Furman. You know, we have this amazing moment. I mean, you've seen so many of them on the stage for the, for the last day and a half. There are these amazing voices on the economy coming out of the Biden administration. They're young, they're people of color, they're female. Um, and, you know, we've got to focus on lifting them up and letting them be good messengers. Um, that's going to be a, a piece of, of succeeding in telling new stories about the economy. I mean, that's just two examples, messengers and, and new indices, but there's so many. I mean, there's got to be a Hollywood strategy. There's got to be a faith-based strategy. I mean, the conservative uh, narrative, um, you know, it was a, a whole of, <laughs> a whole of society approach, right? I mean, they were in every nook and cranny. It was well-resourced too. So I just think, you know, it's a little bit of a scattered answer, but there's just so much here, but I, but I do think dedicating resources to, um, dedicated folks who are thinking about this day in and day out at unexpected places, right? There isn't like an official credentialed narrative change, uh, degree program. Um, all of us are kind of learning a lot of this in real time, bringing different backgrounds and experiences to it. Um, but you do have to spend some time thinking about it. It's not something that happens, you know, if you're spending 10% of your day on, mm -hmm. on narrative change. Um, 
I think one thing to sort of add in terms of like, you know, what both like Alexis and like Lindsay were saying is that, yeah, we have all these like amazing messengers, these champions in the administration right now. And they're, you know, providing these green shoots of like what is possible. So we do also have to do a lot of work, like and maybe this is strategic communications and a whole bunch of other things, like I'm not, you know, the technical expert here, but to protect them, to protect the wins that they have, because people want to see them fail, right? They're trying to do something really hard. And so you do have like sort of the, you know, media, like the bit like CNBC, the Wall Street Journal, like just ready to like attack them and what they're doing as like unconstitutional. It's a power grab. It is, you know, they hate business. So, you know, being ready, very rapidly ready to like counter that narrative, like the Wall Street Journal has published 65 op-eds against Lena Khan. You know, they're obsessed. Every 11 days, there's an op-ed. So, but we have to, we can't just let that happen. We have to provide like sort of a counter to that all the time. I think protecting our messengers and our champions is really, you know, important. And just like plus one on the Hollywood strategy, the faith-based strategy, all these other like stakeholders that we have not brought into mm -hmm. this, I think is just really, really important. The one funny thing I will say is that my astrology app <laughs> does mention monopolies. I'm not kidding. I can send you guys a screenshot, <laughs> but one day, yeah, on Sunday it said like this week, you know, a center was like, it's a good week. The stars are aligned to be like, you know, take on monopolies. And I was like, well, every day in my work is like a good day to take on monopolies. But so, you know, it's just like shows that it's there. You know, people get it. Manifest. It's a little bit of a joke, but it happened. You, you bring up a really important point about protecting the wins. So I'm wondering if uh, someone would like to speak to a little bit of the role of strategic communications in narrative change. Uh, maybe just expanding on protecting the wins, but I think it goes a bit beyond that. Yeah, I think something... That, that prompts for me is, you know, the difference in that like strategic communications, you should always be very clear about like who your audience is. And if your audience is the general public, you're doing it wrong. Um, but the reality is in narrative change, your audience ultimately kind of is the general public. And so I think that what, you know, Lindsay was just saying about we have to have kind of all these different strategies that are going through different uh, places within society is really important. I'm glad to hear we've already went over the astrology yeah. app builders, core core constituency. Um, but yeah, so you really have to think about, you know, how are we kind of coming at this from all different angles so that like ultimately we kind of get to that common sense and, and there's lots of different pathways you can take to get there based on, you know, what how you identify and sort of um, where, where you sit. But I think that's definitely, um, that's a big, a big piece of it. Um, and then sort of in, in protecting the wins, you know, I think in it, it's all, it, again, it, I like, I, I'm not trying to be Pollyanna-ish, but it is all the things that we're doing. And so like, I, I see, yes, there's the negative op-ed there out there about Lena. And then there are like 15, 20 groups that are going and like taking that apart piecemeal. And I think sometimes we feel like, oh, we're just existing in this bubble and like none of it is filtering out, but I, I, it does. And you can see that in sort of public opinion polling and things are shifting and anecdotal evidence. Um, and so I think that, you know, you just, we just got to keep walking gum and walking gum, walking and chewing gum at the same time. Walking gum is what I do. Yeah. Right. <laughs> more, more of my thing. Yeah. Question. Um, yeah, I, I think um, what would be curious also is if for those folks in the room, um, we've, we've talked a little bit about messengers and about uh, how to create a resonant story. What tools or tactics have we not discussed that you think is really important for people to take away? So one of the tools for us is really recognizing the intersection between the crises in our democracy and in our economy and how they're fundamentally intertwined. And so for us, a big part of the starting point is to engage in deliberative discussions around what matters for our well-being now and for generations to come. And when you ask people what they love about where they live, nine times out of 10, it's people and communities, right? And so that is always a starting point for recognizing that there is more that unites than divides people in terms of their vision for the future. And once you have that sort of buy-in, utilizing not just, the, of course, codifying that in, in clear targets, longer term targets, but also utilizing art and music and culture to not just articulate, but internalize this new vision. And having that as a starting point then for multi-stakeholder collaborations and organization around 
co-creating new economic strategies. Because one of the really exciting examples for me recently was in Spain, they had a, a citizens assembly on climate and they had a, a hundred randomly selected citizens come together to discuss what kind of strategy was needed to um, combat climate change. And the proposals were all really like systems change, economic systems change proposals around, um, you know, regenerative agriculture and green uh, architecture and industry and the intersections between ecology and human health, et cetera. And all of those proposals now are going straight to parliament and to um, like the prime minister's office for consideration. And so similar work is happening right now. We're starting, yeah, in like Vermont and California and Puerto Rico around how do we engage in a participatory process to develop that new star to codify that as the new goal of government um, and for society at large. And then so we can begin to evaluate our economies by its capacity to deliver on this. And one of the exciting examples just this past week was, you know, we facilitated a knowledge exchange within the US federal government and the Canadian government, because the Canadian government has not only developed a new quality of life framework, but is also a new budgeting system that is aligned to that. So they're trying to now reform the way that they're spending so that is oriented towards impacting um, clean water and air, a sense of meaning and purpose, yeah? They recognize that a sense of meaning and purpose is really important and they didn't have data for it. And so they figured out how to get data for it because we've just seen here in the United States, I mean, people are lonely. There's an epidemic of loneliness we're anxious and we're sad and we're disconnected from one another. And if that can't be an entry point for a failure of our system, you know, I don't really know what is. Um, and so bringing those, those stories, those connections um, into this broader process of, of democratic and economic transformation, I see as, as very hopeful. I just want to add and sort of underline, because I think Amanda's answer is such a great example of like the reality is that we make the biggest leaps uh, in narrative change when organizing, policy, strategic communications are all working together in tandem. And I know, I think anybody that's like worked on any kind of campaign or advocacy effort, like you feel that the day where like the, you know, what your principal's out talking about is aligning with what your organizers are talking about, you know, which is like what you're getting interview questions about, like, that's when you feel like it's really the ground is actually shifting. Um, so I think it's like bringing all of those different pieces together, like they should not exist in silos. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, I'm really appreciating all these great case studies, these examples, I want to open it up for questions. Um, and I think a mic is going to get passed around. Um, so Ben, just please wait till uh, you get the mic so that people online can also hear you, hear the question. Hi, uh, Melissa Botach from National Women's Law Center. Great panel discussion. Um, a question I had was sort of going back to the example of JAWS. Um, this is sort of an example in pop culture. Um, and thinking about sort of not the A storyline, but the B storyline, like that Dirty Dancing is a movie also about abortion or that in The Incredibles, you know, you actually see Jack-Jack being cared for and it's hard and it's real work. Like in a time when media and pop culture is so segmented, what are some of the ways in which you're thinking about pop culture and those B storylines as a way to sort of change what common sense is because it's that background noise as opposed to just like the in-your-face message? Yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, I was actually, earlier this week, I was talking to um, Participant Media, which is the uh, studio behind Roma um, and Inconvenient Truth. Um, and I kind of asked them sort of the same question, right? Which is like, how do we come at it? And I think something that they flagged, which I really appreciate, is like, you have to lead with the story first, right? Um, it has to be entertaining, it has to draw people in. And I think the mistake that we often make when we try and translate this stuff to entertainment is that it comes off as pretty didactic. And nobody wants to be preached at when you've paid twenty, what thirty dollars now to like go into a movie theater. Speaking of inflation, um, so I think that's really critical um, of you know thinking about like what are what are the stories out there? Where you, how do you like sneak in the the, the cauliflower and the mac and cheese? Um, <laughs> is is a good way to do it. Please. Hi, so I'm Arlene Geiger. I lead a, a grassroots swing left group and we do canvassing. So we started doing deep canvassing. So I was really wondering what 
um, ha have you have any of your groups worked with deep canvassing because there you're really getting you're soliciting people's stories so we're not handing them a story we're soliciting their stories and responding with you know our you know resonant stories uh, of our own if you know possible so could you speak to your involvement with um developing helping to develop um deep canvassing I think that that's actually an area of work for us. Uh, we do solicit like stories or other area, you know, platforms through which I feel like we are able to like collect stories. Our research director has a, you know, a sub stack, which again, obviously it reaches only a certain kind of audience, but he has people sending him like tips and stories about monopolies from like across the country that you wouldn't really like even think about. But in, yeah, in terms, I think that this is like an area of opportunity where we have to like bridge that gap and like work with organizations like yours and like really help sort of, uh, yeah, get the stories that we need to help like sort of, you know, and insert that into these like campaigns and these fights and these ask for policy change. So that I will sort of own up to that. Oh, I would say, I think, yeah, the sort of story banking aspect is really important. Um, the other thing, and I, I mentioned briefly earlier, but uh, we worked on a project with uh, Community Change and, and Jeff Parcher, if folks over there know him, um, on these sort of narrative ideas labs where they basically trained their organizers in the how to um, sit down with a group of folks and really like get them to be like, okay, what's wrong with the economy? If you could fix it, how would you fix it? And like, let's see what, so it's not just like asking people about their stories, which is important, but also asking them for their opinions mm -hmm. about how to fix the problem, which as we were talking about, goes back to that question of agency um, that really generated some, some super interesting ideas. So I would, I would definitely encourage talking to, to Jeff and the community change folks about that as just one example. Yeah, I would just add, I think, you know, the corporate profiteering and inflation work we did um, showed up a lot on the campaign trail. And um, that wasn't really a, a top down strategy entirely. I mean, there was a lot of like, there were a lot of pollsters in DC being like, ooh, winning message, like, let's run with this. So in that sense, there was a top down component, but um, folks were hearing on the doors that uh, prices were the top issue for folks. And um, a, a good example of this, I think, is is housing costs were a, a top, top issue. Um, and, you know, what we saw last cycle in Nevada is, um, you know, in response to the fact that um, folks were hearing about housing housing costs on the doors when they were talking to voters and folks, um, you know, a, a sort of corporate profiteering inflation narrative around landlords um, was deployed really effectively. I mean, you saw Stephen Horsford was in a tight uh, you know, a tight reelect in Nevada, um, you know, talking about it for five minutes on the debate stage and leading, you know, leading letters on it in Congress. And, you know, um, so I think there, you know, there was like a nice synergy between, you know, what folks were hearing when they were talking to voters and then, and then how this stuff played out. Um, so there was a sort of bottom up element of it too, which I think was quite helpful. Hi, all. Um, I feel like I should ask a question, and uh, I spend a lot of time thinking about these things, so maybe it's not fair, but I'm going to do it anyway. Um, maybe you guys can give me some you know, insight and advice. So talking about economic indicators, um, if you're going to get away from talking about sort of traditional indicators like GDP and growth and even jobs to some extent, um, since that's so baked into this neoliberal narrative, what is it going to take to convince people when they're so used to hearing those things? And I mean, to some extent, we are going to make that case too, right? We're going to say this is the right thing to do and it's good for the economy. Um, but how do we start to change what's good for the economy? I'm kind of looking at you, Amanda, for this yeah. one, but, it could, but I'd be interested to hear from you all. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I can give an example, and this is one of the things we're, we want to do here as well, is, I mean, in Canada, they just did a national public opinion survey, and they had people rank on a range of 1 to 10 how much they felt that economic growth should be the is a good indicator of success, how much quality of life should be our indicator of success. And people overwhelmingly were in support of quality of life. And that was across also businesses as well, like different groups that they expected would have been more resistant to it actually also were in support of that. And that's a good starting point um, to just yeah acknowledge that people do want to move beyond that. And then 
at the next level, um, it is about, you know, how do you choose those different domains? And so in Wales, they went about a process of engaging with their citizens, asking them, what kind of whales do you want to leave for your children and grandchildren? And through that process, they identified these seven well-being goals, which were around a more equal whales, a more resilient whales, and with resilience really being centered in biodiversity conservation, actually, um, a, like a healthier, more culturally vibrant, more globally responsible, et cetera. And so with this, they had the government, everyone, think about, OK, what kind of indicators would we need in order to measure progress in these areas, ideally with indicators that would Across, across multiple ones to make it easier and that we're gonna be simple and intuitive to understand. But critically, they also took that next step of saying this is also about principles of governance reform too, of recognizing that we have to take a longer term vision to be more preventative mindset. So not just constantly trying to put out fires, but really try to prevent them in the first place and to have a national level vision and targets and goals but also to allow for local communities to develop the strategies that were aligned with that context. And I think this is really important for us as well to acknowledge that if, again, if we're talking about economies as the way we produce and provide for one another, that's always gonna be influenced by our history, our geography, our cultures, our policies, and like many other factors, right? So we're talking about economies, not economy. And I think that's been one of the biggest issues with contemporary economic thinking is this one size fits all kind of theory of humanity and society and to make space for that also then allows, I think, more space for, for empowering new narratives and ideas of, of how you go about it. Um, so for us, the how, I think, is, is probably more useful a lot of the times than necessarily the what. I think there's a question. Oh, yeah, there you go. Yeah. Hi. Uh, sorry. <laughs> um, uh, so I don't disagree that, like, we need more stories and that we probably get the story to data ratio wrong. But I will just say that we've all seen, everyone's seen Jaws and there's still lots of people at the beach. So I just think data still does have a role in all this. But my question is, um, so I was involved in some focus groups and polling, this is a little while back, but you know, I sort of feel like, you know, we've made progress on defeating the neoliberal and undermining that. And there's a lot of residual articulation of it, but like within the public, it's not like they're embracing it and, and deeply believe in it. Um, but what I ran into in this, you know, exercise a few years ago was that you could kind of, you know, you could convince people corporations were bad and they're out to get you and all this stuff. The hard part was when you started talking about government being the solution, you know, and I understand you wouldn't describe it as government being the solution, but they figure that out, you know, at some point. That's when you started to run into, you know, you, we, we, we had a much harder time getting to our solutions than we did knocking down theirs or knocking down sort of their narrative. So I'd just be interested in how we do that. Thanks. I could start with that because this is something that we experience a lot. And it comes back, I think, at the last panel. I really genuinely think that the biggest barrier is our own imaginations when it comes to the economy. And we tend to be very stuck in this capitalist socialist dichotomy, like those are the only options. But often that is centered in markets versus the state. Yeah, so it's either bigger business or bigger government, right? And that's kind of the, the one or other solution. And so starting out by recognizing that there's the public sector, there's a private sector, but there's also a third sector, yeah? And that is community and civil society and households and the way that we care for one another, right? I think that already helps to unlock a bit like our imaginations between these, these two spaces. And for us, we really try to illustrate and promote the vision of a well-being economy as a third way, right? So this is a, both of the capitalist and socialist, I would say narratives are still very growth oriented. It's just that you grow the economy and then either believe it's gonna trickle down or you grow the economy and you take some of that wealth through taxes to fix the damages done to people and plan in the process, right? And But we have another option of moving upstream, of using government. Government is really important, right? So is you know enterprise. But to actually design our economies in a way that it delivers on our social and ecological goals in the first time around, right? By being more regenerative and circular and equitable um, and inclusive and really 
supporting and making space for the kinds of ways in which the non-monetary, and I think this is important as well, aspects of the ways that we provide and connect with one another, because those are so core to our sense of belonging um, and trust in societies as well. Yeah, I totally agree with you, Amanda. And I think that uh, folk, we spend way too much time talking about markets and government and not enough, um, if, even here today, about the role of communities in civil society. And I do think that that is a, like a wedge with which to break that that dichotomy. And I think there was a lot of, you know, we saw a lot of examples in the pandemic of mutual aid societies coming together, like people and communities, like just figuring out solutions. Yeah. Um, and then sort of being these like labs of things that could then float up and into, you know, government or the private sector, yeah. which is really exciting. Um, and I think the other thing that that's, that great question sparks for me is also like why we have at this conference and just in everyday conversations I've been having, why there's so much urgency around the importance of getting this implementation right like when there has been such a pronouncement pronounced like decline in trust in sort of government and institutions and now we've funneled you know four trillion dollars into our government it is really important that people are going to be able to see that that actually having an impact on their lives and like i think this is a real like generational opportunity um to build up uh you know people's belief in the capacity of government to do good so yeah, I, I would just add, like, government can't be the hero of the story, right? Like, we are. I mean, you know, Groundwork's motto isn't government is the economy, it's we are the economy. Um, you know, we have to center people um, and and human agency in, in the alternative vision. Um, it can't be a story of um, just replacing markets with governments. And just to the IRA point, I think it's uh, what I heard on the stage this morning is, um, you know, government got you know, got their act together and, and got the money passed. And there are a lot of folks still hustling uh, within government uh, to try to implement uh, and make sure that that, uh, that funding is spent successfully. But ultimately, success or failure depends on all of us, right? Depends on, um, you know, how we utilize these projects in our community. It depends on how we organize around them. So, I mean, we, we will be the, the heroes in the story because ultimately that is the only option. I'll give you the last word. We're just running a little bit behind. Uh, I was just going to say that I think maybe we should also say we are also the government. We're not just the economy, but we're also the uh, also the government. And I think yesterday, hearing you know Delia Ramirez speak, the Lieutenant Governor speak, and they are people like us. Like they are really they come from these communities. Like there's a new kind of political leader coming up who I think really represents people. And so they're going to be a key part of. I know this is a C three event, but they're going to be a key part of how I think we shift. Uh, building like trust in government. Yes, so I would be remiss if I did not just say, take this opportunity while I'm here with you all to please, it's more of a request actually. So because we all, we're, just, we're still trying to understand the landscape and the actors and the movements and, and where there's energy and really try to add value where we can, but not duplicate efforts in any sort of respect as well. So if you're interested in engaging narrative work if it's in the US or if you're really also important to get more US actors to engage at the international level as well to showcase what's happening here but also push internationally for different types of reforms as well. I'd just love to connect with you. I hope you'll consider joining we all as a member um, and just reach out anytime if we can ever help. And also you should sign up for Abigail's newsletter on narrative, which is fantastic must read if you're in the space in addition to reaching out to Amanda. So I hope everyone here has walked away with some good case studies, a good shark story, a newsletter to join, people to talk to. We'll continue the conversation in the hallways and beyond. Uh, I wanted to ask you to help me join in thanking this panel for their presentation today. Thank you. I believe we're moving into a break now. The next uh, plenary, the closing plenary is at 310. So uh, we'll see you there. We'll see you back here.